Every day for five years, I walked in and out of this building at school for my science lessons, never questioning who Rosalind Franklin was or why she had a building named after her. It was only when we studied genetics at school that I finally learned of her story. Rosalind Franklin was a scientist whose work was crucial in discovering the structure of DNA. But because she was a woman, all the credit and the Nobel Prize went to her two male colleagues, James Watson and Francis Crick. This was the first time I'd properly considered the discrimination of women in science, and it ignited two passions within me. Firstly, my curiosity about genetics and desire to learn more. And secondly, my frustration about the barriers that women in science had to overcome and the drive to do something about it. This got me thinking about the stereotypes associated with careers in science and how at best they can be harmful and at worst toxic and damaging. So, what do you think of when you think of a scientist? I want everyone to close your eyes now and do your best to picture a scientist. What do they look like? What are they wearing? What gender are they? Now, open your eyes. <laughs> <laughs> I wonder how many of you pictured something like this. An old white man with crazy hair, goggles, and a white lab coat. Historically, and to this day, this is how scientists are portrayed. But this idea of a scientist is influencing the type of people who go into this career, with women only accounting for about 20% of the STEM workforce. This stereotypical idea of a scientist is unrelatable and therefore seems unachievable for so many young people. Despite these stereotypes, gender bias, and the fact that no one in my family had been to uni before, I got a place at Oxford University to study biological sciences. Now, I haven't even mentioned accent bias yet, and I could do a whole other TED talk on the stereotypes associated with being a Scouser. <laughs> and that means coming from Liverpool, if you haven't worked out where I'm from yet. <laughs> but all I can say on that matter is I'm proud of my accent. It makes me me, and it certainly made me memorable at Oxford. During my time at uni, my love for genetics grew even stronger. And after I graduated, I completed two further master's degrees in medical genetics and joined the NHS, where I've worked my way up over the past 10 years to becoming a principal clinical scientist in genetics. Along the way, the story of Rosalind Franklin has resonated within me, and I really wanted to change the face of science and put women at the forefront where we belong. I also wanted more young people to follow in my footsteps, and studies have shown that young people are more likely to pursue a career in which they have a relatable role model. And so, the Skull Scientist was born. My social media platforms and outreach work exist to challenge the stereotypes associated with careers in science, to educate people about healthcare science, in particular genetics, and to provide a role model in science that young people can actually relate to. When I step foot on this stage, wearing this pink dress and speaking in a Scouse accent, you probably never thought I'd be talking about science. And that's not a criticism, but it just goes to show how these outdated views of what a scientist look like are so deeply ingrained in our society. And my platform is not just about women in science, it's about representation, the representation of young people from working class backgrounds with strong regional accents and empowering them to be themselves in the knowledge that they can achieve anything they put their mind to. Because if you can see it, you can be it. So I've already spoken a lot about the stereotypes associated with being a scientist, 
but there are also a lot of stereotypes associated with genetics. And the word genetics or DNA can often send people into panic mode. But my mission today is to change this panic into empowerment. Some of you might recognize some of these recent clickbait news headlines that talk of three parent babies or that every baby in the UK will have their DNA tested. And a lot of the time, genetics is portrayed as something we should be fearful of. But I want to show you how it's actually a force for good and it's changing our healthcare system for the better. So I need to just provide a bit of context here so this will be the quickest science lesson ever for those who perhaps aren't familiar with what genetics is. So if we just go back to basics for a second and think about our bodies, our bodies are made up of lots of different types of cells. Hair cells, muscle cells, skin cells, blood cells, and so on. And within every single cell in our body, we have a set of chromosomes that look something like this, and we inherit these from our parents. If you imagine like beads threaded onto a piece of string, that is how our genes sit on our chromosomes. And inside our genes is our DNA. Now, there are lots of differences between my DNA and your DNA, because that's just what makes me me and you you. It's what makes us unique. However, some DNA changes can be harmful. And it's these harmful DNA changes that me and my colleagues try to identify in patients to provide them with information about their health. When I first became interested in genetics at school, it was a really niche area of the NHS. But now, it is very much part of routine practice. Another thing to note here is that it's more common for scientists like me to use the term genomics rather than genetics now, because genetics refers to the study of single genes, whereas genomics refers to the study of the whole genome, and that's what new technologies have allowed us to do, to study the whole genome, so all the genes and all the other bits of DNA. So you might hear me using the term genomics and genetics interchangeably throughout the rest of the talk. And now I want to tell you two ways in which genomics is being used right now in the NHS to literally save lives. Firstly, genomics is saving the lives of acutely unwell babies in neonatal intensive care units up and down the country. So, if a baby is born and is really unwell, they might end up in the neonatal intensive care unit or NICU. Previously, if a genetic condition was suspected, the clinician would take a blood sample from the baby and send it up to the lab for someone like me to analyze their DNA for one particular genetic condition. I would analyze the DNA and it could come back as negative, so I'd report that to the the clinician and say, no, the baby hasn't got that condition. The clinician might then think of something else. It could be a different genetic condition, send a sample to me in the lab, I'd test for that, and that could come back negative. So the clinician might have to maybe wait until the baby develops more symptoms and think of what else it could be. But this can go on and on and on. And many patients wait years for a diagnosis. And this is known as the diagnostic odyssey. Now, thanks to new technologies, we can perform rapid whole genome sequencing for these babies. That means we can take one blood sample, do one test, and look at all 22,000 genes, 5 million genetic changes, and test for over 6,000 rare genetic conditions in a single test and get the results back in about 10 days. More often than not, this provides a diagnosis for these patients, and from that, they can often be treated successfully. It's literally saving lives. Secondly, I want to talk about personalized medicine or pharmacogenomics, using genomic information to predict how someone will respond to a particular drug. So, to provide some background, a lot of you probably know that one in two of us will get cancer over our lifetime. You probably also know that chemotherapy is one of the most common treatments for cancer patients. 
But what you probably don't know is that a number of years ago, clinicians noticed that after administering one particular type of chemotherapy, a few patients were experiencing severe reactions or even died as a result of drug toxicity. We now know that the reason why these patients were experiencing such severe reactions is because they had a tiny change in a single gene that caused that gene to become faulty. Now, the NHS has introduced a blood test for all patients prior to receiving this type of chemotherapy to check whether or not they have that faulty gene and therefore whether that chemotherapy is safe for them to have. So, Previously, those patients with the faulty gene would have been given the chemotherapy and had severe reactions or even died. Now, because we have that information in advance, those patients with the faulty gene can be given a lower dose or an alternative treatment option that we know is going to be safe for them to have. Now, I know what you're all thinking, well, how are we going to afford this in an NHS that is already underfunded? Well, actually, did you know that adverse drug reactions currently cost the NHS about £2 billion every single year. So doing this genetic test up front is actually a cost-saving. Pharmacogenomics is a huge thing that is really taking off now in the NHS. So me and my colleagues in my role as principal clinical scientist in genetics, we analyse patients' DNA every day for the benefit of their patients and to improve their health outcomes. And the NHS 10-year plan that was introduced, um, that was released earlier this year, has a huge focus on genomics, with the idea to diagnose genetic conditions earlier so that patients can be treated earlier and ultimately live healthier lives, with a focus on prevention rather than cure. As I said before, I first learned about genetics at school in this building right here. And through the story of Rosalind Franklin, I also learned about the discrimination of women in science. Since then, genomics has advanced phenomenally. And I'd love to say that the discrimination of women in science has advanced too. But it does still exist, and more work needs to be done. Now, as I've said, Genomics is becoming a huge part of our NHS, and it's part of routine practice now. So next time you use the healthcare system, don't be surprised when the phrase genetic testing comes up. And instead of going into panic mode, picturing these old men in white lab coats stealing your DNA, <laughs> I want you to think of me. Remember this moment and feel empowered because you've already been educated about genetics by a non-stereotypical female Scouse scientist. <laughs> <laughs>